All right, everybody, let's go ahead and uh, get started tonight. Uh, Ken Holt's going to lead our opening prayer for us. Uh, go ahead, Ken. Okay. Dear Lord, we come to you now at this time, grateful for this avenue we have to all come together to study more of your word, to learn more of your will for us. We ask you to be with us as we take the lessons provided, apply them to our lives to become better for you. We ask you to be with all of those who are going to be your help to bring comfort and healing into their lives. We ask you to be with us in all that we do. In the name of your son, amen. Amen. Thanks, you. Thank you, Ken. All right, a few more people coming in. All right, um, tonight, as you can see from the title, uh, Patience in the Face of Suffering, and really a, uh, a really at this point in the letter, James is getting to the, the place where he's uh, kind of wrapping things up. Um, as you know, at the end of a lot of the New Testament letters, uh, typically it's Paul, of course, he wrote uh, the majority of them. But there'll be a, a thing at the end or a, a list of commands, a list of greetings, different things that are being given. And that's, that's kind of where we are in, in James chapter 5. James is getting, giving a, you know, a little bit of, um, uh, just a, a little bit of, not random at all. I mean, purposeful, but uh, uh, jumping around a lot in his topics. And we're even going to see that a, a teeny bit here in 7 through 11. And by the way, we're probably going to do verse 12 as well. As I got into it, I thought, and, and you'll see one of the authors I was looking at, he kind of groups 7 through 12 together, and they really do form a, a nice little tight literary unit. Uh, but before we get into tonight's stuff, I do have several. A lot of you had some great things to add uh, last week at the, uh, at the end. Uh, David Wagner, um, in the chat, I didn't, I can't really... I can look at the people's names. I can see if someone raises their hand and unmutes and stuff like that. But to keep the chat box up on this teeny little screen is, is next to impossible. So I haven't been doing that. But afterwards, I saw in the chat and David uh, said in, in his mind, King Solomon is, was the richest man ever to exist. And, and of course, that is, that is uh, probably a, just as good an argument. Um, and anyway, so I have a few of those verses up that talk about King Solomon. Uh, 1 Kings 10, 23 to 25, and it's almost word for word the same in 2 Chronicles 9. Uh, Thus King Solomon excelled all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. And the whole earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put into his mind. Every one of them brought his present articles of silver and gold, garments, myrrh, spices, horses, and mules, so much year by year. So here he's elevated above all the other kings of the earth um, in his riches and of course in his wisdom as we, as we know. And then another passage about Solomon. He sat on the throne of the Lord as king in place of David his father and he prospered and all Israel obeyed him. All the leaders and the mighty men and also all the sons of, the, of King David pledged their allegiance to King Solomon. And the Lord made Solomon very great in the sight of all Israel and bestowed on him such royal majesty as had not been on any king before him in Israel. And then another uh, great uh, comment that was brought up um, at the end of class, and we did share this, I just thought I'd read it uh, for us. Revelation 6, 9 through 11. We were talking about uh, the sometimes the personification, but sometimes people actually calling out, but this whole idea of calling out to the Lord and the, and the Lord hearing uh, the, the, the calling forth, like Abel's blood uh, calling forth from the earth, Sodom and Gomorrah, the, the terrible things happening there was a cry up to the Lord. And then uh, Daniel Falkenheim mentioned um, the martyrs in Revelation calling out, how long, how long, how long are we going to have to wait until... Uh, Lord, you, you provide your judgment, your vengeance. And so Revelation 6, 9 through 11, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness that they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, 
O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. So uh, just a, a very uh, uh, emotional crying out uh, here in Revelation 6, 9 through 11. And then one more thing that, that came up after class, um, uh, Lynn Moore uh, shared this passage from Proverbs uh, chapter 30, verses 8 and 9. And, um, and here we, we were talking about the, the corrosive power of wealth. And this is a passage which kind of makes you realize, okay, you don't want to be super poor and you don't want to be super rich. So this one kind of puts things uh, in the middle. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. And so anyway, a nice uh, proverb there, obviously. I think um, when I was cutting and pasting this, I think this is one of the sayings of Agur, uh, A-G-U-R. Uh, of course, the proverbs have uh, several different authors, people putting forth their, their proverbs. So and, and this just gets at the danger of being too rich. Um, it, being too rich, the danger would be, and not that you're not allowed to be rich, but if you're too rich, which is kind of what we were getting at last week, there's the temptation, there's the, there's the chance that someone in that place would not trust in the Lord. They would begin to trust in themselves. Uh, here it's worded, deny you and say, who is the Lord? And then, of course, in poverty, there are other temptations, and there are just lack of opportunities uh, if someone is in poverty. Uh, they might have to steal. They might have to do something drastic uh, just to stay alive. Um, but probably more likely is just the, 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 the working and the toil that would need to take place where there wouldn't be opportunities or as many opportunities necessarily to share the gospel. Uh, of course, that's, this is Old Testament. Uh, here, but in our context, you know, if we're if we're in stress and full of anxiety day by day because we're we're just trying to get that piece of bread to eat, then it's going to be tough. Um, the people, as you know, um, I've got a friend. If you were in the evangelism class last summer, uh, a friend, Monty, who uh, yeah, went to I can't remember. He's been to several different schools. He has his MD. And he also has some religious degrees, which is how I met him. We were in some uh, uh, graduate classes together. Uh, but he's from India, and he's back in India. He runs a medical clinic there. And they're, you know, they're, they're at their peak of COVID right now. And they're, they're, they're not able to bury the bodies. Uh, they're, they're, they're burning them out in the fields um, just because there's nothing to be done. There's just so much death right now. And... People outside his medical clinic or underneath the trees. They have um, oxygen and IVs on some of the people outside. They just, I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just a terrible situation right now. Well, because of that, obviously, there's, there's some evangelism going on with the, the people maybe right at the medical clinic, but they're not able to go out and, and have a time of evangelism um, because there's just too much else going on, too much tragedy. And uh, so that's the other side of it. It's, it's nice, and we have been very blessed for uh, decades and really hundreds of years here in this country to be able to, uh, to kind of be in a middle ground um, compared with the world, obviously extremely wealthy, but to be in a place where um, hopefully we're not too well off where we say, see you later, God, and uh, hopefully we're not in poverty where we... Uh, can't give God the, the time that we might want to give him as far as uh, service. So anyway, those are some of the things that came up after class last night. I really appreciated all of them. And um, anyway, tonight we move to, and that was just verses one through six of James five. Now we move to seven through 11. Like I said, we'll probably sneak in 12 tonight. And uh, I've got a couple songs. Uh, we move into a place where James is saying, you know what you need to endure. Uh, you just need to make it through. And uh, the, the Lord is near. Uh, with some more talk as we've had from uh, the Thessalonians class uh, concerning the, just the fact that we need to be ready and we need to be um, 
uh, good to go uh, for the Lord. In fact, uh, this I may read a little bit out of this one. Um, the um, he um, he calls this section enduring to the end, and I really like that. And that's applicable uh, whether it was two thousand years ago, two hundred years ago, two years ago. Um, that's going to be applicable until Jesus comes back again. Endure to the end, and that's really the message here in James uh, five uh, seven through. Uh, 12 and uh, so really cool so let's um, sing a little bit about that all right thank you um all right so um also from uh, Motyer's book um i wanted to share this with you i thought this was really a a good way to summarize and obviously i just uh, scanned it right out of the the commentary um standing back from verses 7 through 12 we see as a first observation that two subjects alternate uh, with each other so we have uh, patience in verses 7 and 8, and then a statement concerning the tongue. And what a surprise from James, right? We've only been, we have that main section about the tongue, but he brings up the tongue uh, throughout the book. And then in 10 and 11, another statement about patience or endurance, uh, perseverance, steadfastness. And then in verse 12, another statement about the tongue. And uh, Motyer and some others mentioned Peter uh, with this, and we kind of think of Peter as the one who, you know, would kind of just say things without thinking. And Peter was one, and especially since it talks about uh, oath taking in verse 12, Peter was one who was willing to, to, to use the tongue in a way that was, was so glorious. Who do you say that I am? Jesus said, and Peter said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Um, and then when Jesus was going through the trials and all the, the mess, uh, even a servant girl says, you were with him, weren't you? And he, with an oath, he says no. And he denied Jesus the cock crows. Of course, he wept uh, when Jesus uh, made eye contact with him. So Peter's a great example of someone who at times didn't really do too well with that endurance, at least back at the beginning of his uh, ministry, the back at the, when Jesus hadn't even been to the cross yet and had not been resurrected yet. Of course, that all we would think changed. But we're, we are susceptible to the same things in life. We need to make sure that we are uh, patiently enduring, uh, that we um, have patience in our suffering, just whatever's going on in life, we need to be uh, patient uh, in that. Now, uh, we talked about that some Sunday, uh, the fact that we needed a lot of patience as we headed into the pandemic and as we went through the pandemic, and I'm not implying that it's over, but as we come out, we're going to need patience there too. We're going to need to be patient with each other. We're going to need to, we're going to need to endure and be steadfast and persevere even on this other end um, you know, we're hoping of this, of this uh, terrible thing that we've gone through and the terrible thing that some countries are just now peaking with, uh, as we talked about. So the, um, and in any of those situations, there is a temptation to allow the tongue to get the best of us. And so uh, hearkening back to earlier in the letter, uh, we just need to realize it's a fire uh, that it can get us in a lot of trouble, and we need to be uh, careful with that. And he brings that out here uh, once again. And then uh, there's a more detailed look, and I don't know if you'll be able to uh, read this uh, super well, uh, but I'll read it. So we look at it a little more closely. Uh, 7 and 8 talks about the coming Lord, and verse 9 talks about the coming judge. And, of course, the Lord and the judge are one and the same. The farmer's patience is related to God's program of the seasons, and issues in precious fruit. Patience will bear precious fruit for the coming Lord. And then in verse 9, sins of speech will bring us under condemnation. The Lord who is near is also the judge who is at the door. Uh, verse 9. And then the coming end. It's, it's interesting all the different ways that uh, the New Testament talks about coming. And... Of course, sometimes it's just used very generically. Um, you know, here comes someone walking down the street. Uh, this person came into the home of such and such a person. 
But the coming is the coming of the Lord, the coming of the end, the coming of the judgment. And so sometimes, not that we put a capital C in our English Bibles, but kind of like with the fall, the fall of mankind, if you read books about that, it'll have fall capitalized because we're talking about the big fall, not just someone tripping um, as they uh, walk through their yard. So uh, the same is true here. This, this coming is so important. And that's what James emphasizes here at the, at the end. Uh, the, the Lord is at hand. The judge is at the door. And that's how we are to live our lives. We're to live our lives ready, realizing that Jesus could just could come back at any moment in the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet, um, he, could, he could be here. He could be here tonight. We've, we've talked about this a lot with the Thessalonian letters and uh, here with James, and as we've gone through our sermons uh, for the uh, spiritual strength uh, that comes with the spring. <laughs> Those alliterations roll off Greg's tongue. They don't roll off mine too well. So, and then, so the coming end, and uh, here it says the end or the purpose towards which the Lord is working is to bestow compassion and mercy on those who have endured. And of course, we read in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 that his patience, his, his not procrastinating, but his waiting on purpose uh, to come is so that more people can be saved. Uh, God wants the maximum number saved. Um, and then in verse 12, the coming judgment. Sins of speech, once again, the use of, use of oaths, make us liable to fall under condemnation. So again, controlling the tongue. So James flips back and forth, kind of, we would say, pretty encouraging in 7 and 8, and then, ooh, a warning in 9, and then encouraging again in 10 and 11, then another warning in verse 12. And so uh, a lot of the uh, commentaries pointed out, you know, James doesn't use really many connecting words. Uh, with James, it's just boom, 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 boom. And that's kind of what we have tonight. Whereas Paul, you know, prepositional phrase uh, uh, to lead into something. All right. So, okay, so let's dive into our text here. Let's look at seven and eight. Um, Be patient, therefore, brethren or brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Now, we've, we've mentioned before the New Testament readers, and I think the New Testament writers, when they said the coming of the Lord is at hand, you know, there were many who felt, you know, it's going to happen in my lifetime. Jesus is going to come back. You know, we sing Jesus is coming soon, and we, we understand. Again, I think our temptation is that we don't really think it's realistic that he might come back tonight. I think that's our temptation uh, to not have an urgency about us. Um, But they really, if they would have sung that song, (laughs) Jesus is coming soon, they would have been thinking, well, yeah, he's coming soon. He's he's probably going to come in the next few months. And, um, you know, so they had a different perspective. But the, the way the heart works and the mind works with this concept should be the same. We should be ready. We should be uh, prepared for his coming. And as we know, it could be what we consider uh, soon. We're going to read in Second Peter, you know, that we should not count slowness the way that the Lord, you know, we, we don't need to look at it uh, from our perspective. We need to look at it from the Lord's perspective. Uh, those of you who do gardening, uh, you have an advantage over me uh, to understand passages like this. I really feel that it helps Christians when they plant things, when they, um, I think the, the, the farming community understands a lot of scripture better than I would understand it. Um, there's, there's, a, there's just a knowledge that comes with sowing seed in the spring and harvesting it at the end of summer or in the fall. There is just a maturity that comes with that. And I, I've, I've read about that. <laughs> I don't know it at all. I, I have not. I'm sure I planted something in elementary school or in middle school, um, you know, for a science thing uh, in the classroom. Uh, but um, I have never uh, planted anything. 
And uh, so I, I am definitely at a disadvantage. And I recognize that. And I'm, I'm kind of thinking maybe in retirement, <laughs> whenever that'll come, to, um, to maybe plant a garden. Because I think there comes with that some self-control, some patience, some, some attributes that Christians should have. I think in our, in, our, in our world, we have things that illustrate great biblical truths. And that's one that I have just missed out on in my life due to my environment or, or whatever the case may be. But uh, anyway, just in the same way that a farmer waits and has patience, that's how we should have patience. We should realize, yes, the anticipation's there. That's what we call hope. The, the, the realization that something's going to happen, but we can't count on it. We can't plant the seed one day and then the next day have the plant, unless it's a dandelion, because they seem to crop up <laughs> overnight, right? It's amazing. So, but anything that we would want uh, takes some time. So any com bill, you look like you might want to say something. You're just, you're just on the edge of your seat. All right. Very good. All right. Anyone uh, want to say anything about these two verses? I've got some other illustrations here. Hey, Clay. Yeah, go ahead. Just as a whole, like, you know, what Jesus taught about, like, like if you, if you love me, you will obey my commands. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like as long as we obey his commands, it's like we kind of don't really have to ultimately like really worry, worry about these things, you know. And again, that's not to say that that none of things is right. It's not, right. It's not necessary, but I think ultimately, it's I think. It's just connected, you know. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree with you. It's um, we we need balance uh, in our lives. Uh, it needs to be where we, well, and and even beyond balance, uh, we we give it all to the Lord. And if we are loving Him, then some of these other things, being patient and waiting for the Lord, will fall into uh, fall into place. Go ahead, George. I'll say the third word in verse seven is therefore. So it links it back to the wicked, wicked oppressors in that there will be justice. There will be punishment. You know, Habakkuk had to wait for the wicked in Jerusalem and then the wicked Babylonians to be taken care of by God. But there will be justice. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Thank you, George. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, so be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. And uh, a lot of people were connecting that with chapter 3, verse 18. A harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And so another connecting thing that Antonio was, was getting at, uh, when we put these all together, we're commanded to be patient. We're commanded to be people of peace. Um, a lot of these, and if we love the Lord, we will, these things will come together to create a great harvest, to create um, a, a a precious fruit, uh, the, the fruit of the Spirit, ultimately coming forth uh, in our lives. If we are, if, if we don't allow that to take charge, so to speak, then we'll fall into the traps of verse 9 and verse 12. We'll fall into the traps of, the, of our, our speech uh, getting the best of us. Um, sorry about that. There's verse uh, 18 uh, for y'all. Um, then verse 9. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Um, tons of passages about uh, us not complaining, grumbling, us uh, saying things that are encouraging to one another as opposed to discouraging. Um, we don't want to be at odds. And as I mentioned Sunday, I think, I, I think, for the most part, we, it's just been amazing. Um, the, the patience, uh, the endurance, the, the love, um, the really the, the perseverance we've had, all of us with each other uh, during the past year, because there have been times where it's been a little bit tough, um, if, if not the whole year, um, but, but everyone's been very patient, I think. Everyone's been willing to uh, to deal with, 
there, there have been polarizing opinions about how to handle different things. And, and, and people, you know, we're all sitting in here. We're all here together. And on Sundays, we're all together. And it's, it's really been um, an amazing thing, I think. And I think, uh, you know, I, I think God has been happy with the lack of grumbling uh, for the most part. We've, we've all had our moments probably. But, uh, but for the most part, being able to put this into practice in a very difficult time. Now, obviously, the context here is uh, more the idea of, of wealth. That's been the theme of chapter 5 here up to this point. These, as George mentioned, these landowners um, just being hideous in their behavior um, and, and everyone needing to, you know, handle that, persevere through those things. Um, the judge is standing at the door. Uh, the Lord is coming. So let's look at uh, 2 Peter 3, 8 to 16 real quick here. Do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So the Lord at hand and the judge standing at the door, yes, it's true, but we should not have any kind of perspective that God is procrastinating, that God has no intention of doing what he says he's going to do. Those things aren't true. Don't count slowness um, in our own way. Um, God is doing it because he wants people to be saved. Verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people are you to be? Well, we ought to be people of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God. It's, it's no sin. It's the last prayer in the Bible, as we mentioned last week or maybe Sunday. The last prayer in the Bible is come Lord Jesus. And so it, it's no sin to pray what the martyrs prayed. How long? How long? We want you to come back, Jesus. We're, we're ready to leave this place that is not our home. We're ready to go home. We're ready to be with you eternally. So hastening it, but waiting and being patient because we want more people to be saved too. Um, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish. And once again, we have at peace. Not grumbling, not fighting, not in dissension, but at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation. Again, it's not procrastination. It's not, it's, it's not the Lord trying to decide if he's going to, you know, come back or not. It's not that. It's he's patient. And we're called to be patient, to endure, to make it through the suffering, to persevere. Uh, just as our brother Paul also wrote to you, according to the wisdom given him, uh, read into that maybe First and Second Thessalonians. Uh, they would have been written long before Peter wrote as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. And then James echoing Christ as well, as we have in our text. So uh, pretty, pretty amazing. This is our job, uh, to wait and speed the coming of the Lord. Um, so once again, don't grumble. Don't let your mouth get you in trouble with the grumbling. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. All right. So then 10 and 11, as an of suffering. So if you're not sure how this looks, as an example of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. The steadfastness of Job. And you've seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Let me pause here. David, I didn't see that you had unmuted. Uh, this is David Moore, for those of you. Go ahead. Go ahead, sir. Oh, yes. 
Um, I had something to say about the tree bearing fruit and uh, planting okay. and all that. Um, you know, the way I look at this is that, uh, you know, we planted a garden when I was a kid. And uh, when we planted the seeds, um, God made them grow, like it said. But uh, um, if we had not uh, worked with the garden, pruning, weeding, um, you know, working with the garden, um, the, uh, the vegetables and the fruits would have been very few mm -hmm. on the, on the uh, plants. But to, to, to bear a lot of fruit, you know, we did work all summer long. So I uh, kind of compare this to a, when someone becomes a Christian, we, we need to make sure that they don't just stay like a, a stock, but uh, we have to help prune that new Christian into bearing much fruit into maturity. And I think a lot of times, um, um, you know, God makes the seed grow, but then there isn't that human intervention. And uh, a lot of Christians just go off and do their own thing and don't mature and have that attitude like we're talking about here in James. It's a matter of heaven and how and a person's whole mindset needs to be that way. But I think if they're not around enough Christians, if they're not being uh, pruned in a sense by the church, um, you know, they, they won't bear as much fruit. They, 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 they won't bring as many people with them into heaven in a sense. Mm -hmm. well, in addition to what you just said, one of the um, amazing uh, things that you touched on or the thing that you implied is that God uses us um, to accomplish uh, his goals. And so we are used. Um, you know, God is the vine dresser, of course, but God uses us, and we do need, we do need to be mindful of those things, as you were saying, David, and 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 help each other. And that's one of the things we've really missed the last year is the uh, the fellowship opportunities, the uh, which are times of growth, and uh, you know, really, really uh, important for us. The prophets all suffered for for God's name, you know, and. I just think that it's really awesome how the whole Bible lines up, how that theme is consistent like throughout the whole Bible, you know, the suffering. And, but also how, how even though we know that as Christians that, you know, like I know myself, I don't want to suffer, <laughs> you know. Uh, so it's uh just uh i just find it like really um profound like how how that theme of suffering is is found throughout the whole bible you know yeah i i agree with you and um of course our ultimate um example is christ himself um and and that's that's always the example for us given in, or at least I shouldn't say always, but uh, typically that's the example given for us to help us endure because Jesus went through it. And um, we should um, expect to suffer. Uh, Jesus said, as the world hated, hates me, it's gonna hate you. And so, you know, we, we shouldn't be surprised when we face tough stuff. Um, part of the reason that we suffer, of course, is because of the sin in the world. And, and also we suffer because we make mistakes. Uh, we, we definitely bring some of it on ourselves uh, when we sin, uh, when we do wrong things. But it's a, it's a fallen world and we're going to face it no matter what. Um, and we're going to face some of it because we're Christians, uh, just plain and simple. There's, there is going to be persecution. We've been blessed, again, for many decades and even a couple hundred years um, in this environment. Um, to, uh, for most of us not to have to suffer too much, um, like Christians around the world. 
Uh, but there are, there are martyrs uh, right now, people dying uh, for the Lord. Uh, Monty, my friend, when they baptize, um, uh, when they baptize the Muslims there in India, uh, those, those new converts know they may only have two or three weeks to live. If, if some of their, um, if some of their uh, relatives find out, um, then they'll be killed. Just, you know, so they, so they baptize people and these, ba these baptized believers know that it may only be about a month. Now, sometimes, depending on the area in India, um, and d just depending on the uh, veracity of, of the people that are part of that person's family, you know, they may get to live, you know, a full life. Um, but we just haven't faced that here. You know, people don't become Christians and get killed for it. Uh, but they do around the world. And, uh, you know, we, anyway, it's just, that's, that's part of, that's another reason it's a theme, because it's been going on for, uh, God's people have suffered for 6,000 years, you know, in one form or another. So, um, really, it's tough. It's tough. But that's, that's, that's why we sing about the things we sing about we can look forward to the next life. Um, so who can endure? Um, a lot of the prophets did talk about this. Can, you, can your courage endure or can your hands be strong in the days that I shall deal with you? I, the Lord, have spoken and I will do it. Uh, Joel 2.11, the Lord utters his voice before his army. And by the way, when you read Lord of hosts, uh, that's really the concept. Uh, Lord of armies is literally what it means. And um, so the Lord utters his voice before his army his hosts, for his camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful. For the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the heat of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire and the rocks are broken into pieces by him. Who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. So if someone's outside in our context, if someone's outside of Christ, if someone is not in union with God, the person's not going to endure. But you know what? Who can endure? We can because of Christ. And so that's, that's pretty awesome. Now, we could not endure God's wrath, which is what some of this is getting at. Um, but we don't have to face it because Jesus took God's wrath upon himself on the cross. That's the whole reason the cross happened, so that God's punishment could be taken for us by the perfect one, uh, Jesus Christ. Um, Lamentations, I can't, uh, I, I can't not <laughs> quote this, talking about endurance. Um, so Jeremiah is lamenting all the things happening to God's people there in Jerusalem. He says, he's made my teeth grind on gravel, made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. You've seen how many times peace has been mentioned tonight in these various passages. But my soul is bereft of peace. I've forgotten what happiness is. So I say, my endurance has perished. So has my hope from the Lord. Remember my affliction and my wonderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul is, continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. And then, verse 21, <laughs> But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. So Jeremiah, my hope's gone, my endurance is gone, all these things are gone, but you know what? Not really. I call this to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. And read Jeremiah, by the way. For him to be able to say this in the midst of all that is amazing. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. And just as James said, you know, hey, if you're, if you're not sure what endurance, patience, and suffering is all about, look back at the prophets. And I would say also look back at Christ. He's hanging on the cross. And what's he doing? He's thinking about his mom. He's thinking about John. He's thinking about the people who put him on the cross. Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing absolutely incredible. We're called to that same kind of perspective. We're called to that same kind of attitude. Uh, no matter what's going on, none of us are going to be put on a cross. None of us are going to bear the sins of the world. None of us are going to be in a situation like Jeremiah was. And so we should be able to endure and persevere and have patience 
in suffering, which is what this passage in James uh, is about. So, of course, uh, let's uh, sing this. All right. And the other person mentioned here, of course, is Job. And I'll just reference you back to Greg's, um, well, we kind of co-taught, but the, uh, the class on Job uh, for the first nine weeks of this quarter. And you can find those on YouTube. <laughs> so, but anyway, we understand how Job endured what he was going through. Now, he complained a lot. And, uh, you know, he, he probably had a right to a little backdoor dealings between God and Satan. But you know what? Job endured. He made it through it just as God knew he would. Satan didn't think he would say, oh, he just, he just is faithful because everything's going well for him. God knew that wasn't the case. He was faithful because he was a man of faith and he had steadfastness and he endured. Um, you've seen the purpose of the Lord, the last couple of lines here, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. And that's our God. So um, verse 12, I'll just read it. We'll talk about it next week. It's uh, Pat giving you guys some time to fellowship. We've been going for 50 minutes. Uh, but above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath. But let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Again, the tongue. Just don't let the tongue get you in trouble, James is saying. Uh, patiently endure, deal with your suffering, don't grumble with each other, hang tight, and in the midst of all that, don't let your tongue get you in trouble. Um, you don't want to fall under uh, condemnation. So we'll, we'll look a little bit more at verse 12 uh, next week, and then we'll look at 12 through 18. So let's all pray together. Thanks for your patience uh, tonight. God, we thank you so very much for all the blessings you give us uh, each and every day. Father, you're a great God. You are full of mercy. You're full of compassion. And we thank you so very much for who you are. God, help us to look back at the examples uh, that we have in Scripture. As Antonio was saying, it all fits together so uh, just neatly, tightly. It's really amazing, Father, uh, the different big themes that we can come up with in Scripture. And definitely we have lots of examples, Father, of people who made it through tough times. And so, Father, help us to look at the prophets and look at Job and especially look at Christ and the, the martyrs of the first century, the, the people who died in your name and the people who are still dying today because they are in Christ. And, Father, help us to be sad, of course, but to be encouraged by that and realize, you know, this is worth it. And, and we will be with you for eternity uh, someday. Father, help our hope to be strong. Help our uh, relationships in Christ to be strong. Uh, Father, continue to bless us as we move through uh, the, the current societal um, and health things that we're going through. Uh, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.